it's good that people do something about their interests. That's what I admire. Um, but when it comes to the Native American world, it's a little bit troubling because most of the material out there is by fakes, you know, by people who say they're Indian and they're not. And uh, some, sometimes these guys set themselves up as shamans, as medicine men, and uh, and they have a whole crew that goes around with them, and they do basically the same thing that these uh, traveling preachers do. See, for those of you in the, in the, uh, who are not in America, um, there's this thing that happens. Um, I guess it started during, oh, gee, I don't know when it started. I want to say it started um, during the Depression, the 1930s, but it might even go back before that. What it is, is it's, it's a traveling preacher who goes from town to town. He might ask a church to um, if he could use their building or something like that. And uh, or he might have a tent, yeah, like a circus tent that he might have a crew with him that they come and they, you know, they get a permit. They go into a town a week before and they get a permit, you know, to have a church services, you know, kind of thing outside of town in some field. So they they get a permit to do that. And in America, when you're a preacher, um, it's it, that's a tax-free business. You you don't have to pay taxes. Um, generally speaking, I mean, I think in, uh, today I think the laws are more complex, and and now there's lines drawn where if you do make profit, I think you might have to. I'm not too sure, but back then it was really a uh, you know a, a wide open business where you could you do you raise money and not have to pay tax on it. So um, these a lot of people they they're kind of, you know they're knowledgeable about about the Bible, but, you know, they're, they're, they're um, what do you call it, they're con artists. And so they would, what they do is they, they um, the tent goes up. Maybe some of their workers show up even before the tent goes up, like a couple of days. Maybe they might check in at a local hotel or, they, you know, whatever. And they, they walk around, they go to towns that are kind of big, you know, not really, really tiny towns, but, because they're, they're going to make money, so they have to go to towns that have a lot of people. Yeah, and so they they when they come in, they 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 observe how everybody's dressing, how everybody's communicating, and then so they learn that. So they they wear clothes that fit into that society. So when they go around town, people don't realize that they're not from there. People think that. You know, since they look like everybody else, that they're all, you know, that they've always lived in that community. They they don't question it. So when they when they when the tent the church tent goes up, the the guy has his church services now. He's going to do healing, yeah, and then he he'll say, "There's." He put his hand up in the air and he said, "The angels telling me that uh, there's a man sitting in the back and he's got arthritis and." And he can't walk, and and his wife left him, and and so the guy be sitting in the back. That's me, brother. That's me, you know. And, and then so they'll wheel him up there, and and then the you know the the Satan get thee hence or get behind me, and the power of Christ compels thee, and and he slaps him in the forehead and he falls off his wheelchair and he rolls around the floor blah 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 blah, 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 blah whatever and then he jumps up and he's jumping up and down hallelujah hallelujah i'm set free and you know and then and then so the preacher will say you do you feel has the arthritis gone he's yeah mr arthur has gone he says and he's just, you know, I feel no pain. He starts clapping his hands. He's doing somersaults and backflips and all kinds of stuff, saying hallelujah, 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 you know, all this kind of, all this kind of wonderful thing here. And um, and and then so the people see that, 
And I get, you know, remember I said in this world there's a, a high level of ta <laughs> ta. That's a, a duality, yeah? And so people, see, this is inside, they want this. This is what, you know, they want everything to be fixed for them. In duality, people don't want to take responsibility for themselves. They look for peace out there. They don't go inside themselves. It's in them, but they don't want to go there because they're afraid to face the, the emotions from their difficulties and from their past. So they don't want to go there. They deny it. They and they go into an emotional denial. So they, they look for the answers out there. They don't want to take responsibility. So as a result, they they just believe whatever. This is the same way of people who believe that everything about Indians is good. They have this preconceived notion that all Indians are good. That the Indian way is the red way and that the red way is the, you know, is the only way. See, that's duality. And um, so pe people are really irresponsible. They want somebody to make things right for them when the reality is they're the only ones who can do it. You are the only one who can save you. They don't want, they don't want to believe that. They want somebody else to do it. That's how come man created the idea of Jesus Christ, taking away everything. See, the irresponsibility there. So... People, and it's, it seems like people don't want to take responsibility for themselves because it involves pain and they don't want to feel pain. Because of their duality, they define pain as a bad thing. That this, you know, so they want to only feel happiness, which means they want to live in an emotion. And when you do that, you stop the learning process in your life. Yeah, because remember, when you learn from your difficulties, all the emotions that are with that, they start to leave and they're replaced with peace, but they don't they don't even want to face it. Yeah, dualistic people don't even want to face it, so they'd rather deny that they have that pain and they try to force themselves to do, you know, to do something to only feel happiness. If, so this is why in their belief system they say, well, after you die, you go to a place of eternal happiness. And in the, in, when early missionaries and priests were talking to Indians, you know, before the reservation time and saying that heaven was a place of eternal happiness and where the sun's always shining and, and, and these Indians said, well, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be happy all the time because, see, they knew the value that we're, it's okay to be happy, but not all the time. Because if we try to do that all the time, then you become addicted to it. And then you start to avoid the other emotions, and that means you do not learn from your difficulties, and you're missing blessings, and you're not developing your soul. Because when you learn from difficulties, that when those emotions leave, you're you're developing emotionally. That has to happen before you can develop spiritually. This is what they knew, and so what the priests were saying was to go to a place where you'll be where you'll be, you know, eternally happy. This doesn't sound good. Yeah, this sounds unhealthy. This sounds like addiction here. So they didn't want to they didn't want to hear anything of that. You see what I mean? That kind of, I hope that helps you to understand what I mean by emotions are not states that we were meant to live in. They're part of a learning process. They go and they come. Yeah, and you know, just like we will face difficulties again, we'll also face happiness again too. It'll always come back. We let it go. We enjoy it until the next experience comes. Even if it's another blessing, then we're happy some more. But if the next one is a difficulty, then we start learning from it so that whatever emotions it brought will go away. Do you see what I mean? The emotions are always moving. We're not supposed to live in them. They're part of a learning process. They're part of living, but they're not. we're not supposed to live in it. You see what? Do you understand? I hope so. So, in, dual, in duality, people want to live in the emotion. They don't want to. 
They don't want to face their difficulties because the difficulties have those those emotions that hurt. They don't want that. They say that's bad. See? They're just, they label everything as good and bad. And they don't want to feel it. So they're avoiding emotions, which means they're blocking their own emotional development, which then means they do not develop spiritually. So they look for it outside of themselves. That's why they want somebody to tell them what to do. They have no faith in themselves. They have low self-esteem, low self-worth, inferiority complexes, emotional insecurities. And so and they need outside validation. Yeah? So they want somebody to tell them what to do. They want somebody to take it all away. And all that time you you can do it all by yourself. It's not that hard. Yeah? So when they see this TV, uh, this traveling preacher do these fake healing ceremonies, see they, they're they're seeing you know they, they, this is what they want to see, and so then um, they they start you know wow they start crying and they they think everything is real, and 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 then they they all go up there and they and this guy says you know you know to, to after the church services as they're ending. He passes around a collection plate. He's saying, you know, please help us. You know, we're traveling around the the world to spread the word of God and and you know to heal, you know, to bring healing to all people. And we need money to help pay for our gas and you know stuff like that. And so you know, people, they make their money like that. And a lot of these preachers are really evil guys. Yeah, you know? they they they're they're um, some of them are selling drugs on the side, and <laughs> you know, some of their lady they bring, they have prostitutes that work for them and stuff like that, and it's just it's really have a, a wicked business going on. But the whole thing is a con game, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a whole it's all a deception. It's because they know that people don't want to feel the pain in their own lives and they want to experience something that will take it away from them so for at least an hour or two they can escape their reality by coming to their event and they will pay for it yeah they they will they will gladly give up their money to do that that's a con game well that happens in the indian world too there's a lot of fake Indian medicine men that that do the same thing. They have uh, there was the one guy purportedly did one on TV and allegedly healed somebody, but there's no proof that the guy ever had the disease in the first place, because the guy that allegedly had this disease was actually a worker for this fake Indian medicine man. This fake Indian medicines man, his name was Jaime Estes Storm. He's, he says he's a Cherokee. He's not. He's a white man. Now, that doesn't mean he's less. All I'm saying is he's not an Indian to begin with. He, this is what he does. So, he, so then another thing he does is he writes all these books, and they're all dualistic in nature because that's how people are. I mean, dualistic people do not want to leave their their way of living. They don't want to leave this uh, uh, idea of living, seeing things as only this and that. They don't want to. They don't want to see the other. Yeah, they don't want to experience the other. So. Um, he, so he wants to and and see to to make money from them. He this Jaime Estes storm. He wants people to stay in duality because when you, in duality, when you're going to a healer, what you're really doing is you're just getting a band aid, and when that band aid falls off, dualistic people have this strong tendency. To say that, oh, they must have did something wrong. 
that they they never question that. Well, hey, I'm supposed to be healed. That he, that that healer's a liar. That thought doesn't even come to them. Instead, they blame themselves. And so they they'll go back to the healer, and the, and the healer will say, "Yep, you did something wrong." And they say, "Oh, I'm sorry. Here's another thousand dollars. Can you fix it again?" And the healer will say, "Yeah, of course. I'm your you're my brother." Yeah, T- while taking his thousand dollars. And then, and see, see, they never think to question the the medicine man because if they do, that means they now have nobody to go to, and they're lost again, and they they don't want to lose their only sense of hope, even though it's false. And then, so and so then they blame they willingly blame themselves for for getting sick again. And they're wi- they'll willingly pay this fake medicine man whatever he wants because they don't want to be alone. Yeah? They'll do anything to avoid being alone. It's, and, and this is an addiction to, to a pseudo-love. And fake medicine men they need these people to stay like that. So these he, these so-called healers, they don't want their patients to get better. They want them to stay sick as long as they have money. There's a lot of medicine men like that today. Even in the Lakota world. This guy from Dances with Wolves, that the little boy, that he's now a man. What's his name? In the movie, he was smiles a lot, and his real life name, I think, is Nathan, Nathan Chasing Horse or something like that, Chasing His Horse or something like that. These guys are from Rosebud, by the way, but they tell everybody they're from Pine Ridge, as if Pine Ridge is better. You see the dualistic thinking there. The the we don't see it that way. Yeah, in fact, in the Lakota world, when somebody says they're from Pine Ridge, their first thought is, "Oh Jesus, <laughs> is this guy cool, or is he a troublemaker?" <laughs> That's the first thought. <laughs> or he's gonna be way too serious. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but when somebody says they're from Standing Rock or Cheyenne River. Or rosebud, it's a different. It's more of a cool, laid-back feeling. Yeah, so <laughs> that's how we see it amongst ourselves. But uh, the world out there thinks Pine Ridge is the only Lakota place, and it's not. It's just one of many. Yeah, and um, even then, they're not even the biggest tribe either. Yeah. So, um, anywho, this Nathan um, back in the uh, Early 2000s, he um, he did a, a, a humbletch, a, a crying for a vision ceremony, and then he came down and and then he had his sister dye his hair in the back from the scent from the from his crown, and and he had his sister dye his hair white from there to all the way down, just in the back like a stripe, like a skunk stripe. And he now he tells people that when he came down from the hill, his hair was all, that the spirits did that to his hair. That's what he says. But the reality is that he had his sister dye his hair, and so he's 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 doing this because he's telling people he's a medicine man, and he has a following in California, and um, he 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 charges money. For his, the cerem- the fake ceremonies that he does, and uh, people really have low self esteem, and they'll do anything for him. Yeah, he's like a cult leader. He's dualistic. See, a cult leaders are all dualistic. Cult leaders, terrorist groups—they're all dualistic. They want to control people. They want 
people to say, gee, you're our Messiah. We'll do anything for you. See, this is a personality disorder. This is not the Lakota way. Yeah? And so um, that that's a good example of a Lakota, a fake, a Lakota uh, who is a fake medicine man. So he really he's a showman, yeah. He really can put on a show. He's like these these TV, these these traveling preachers from, you know, that I was just describing to you. This this is he does the same thing. His dad is the same way. And these are, these guys are all fake. They are Lakota, but they're not real healers. They're fake. They're doing this for money. Yeah. When Dances with Wolves first came out. They went to, uh, him and his dad were going up and down the east and west coast, and they were going to all these uh, events um, where there's no Lakota people, okay? And then they would say that they're raising money to build a center to help the Indian kids, to get them off drugs and stuff. So they're, it's going to be a big center, and they're going to build a school to teach the kids the language and culture. So people were writing them checks, thousands of dollars. So they would drive back to, um, you know, their where they live, in, in really fancy vehicles. And that school never was built. The youth center was never built. And the the people of uh, Pine Ridge had no idea that these two were doing this. And these two are not even from Pine Ridge. They're from Rosebud. See what I mean? Fake medicine. Man. It's amazing that people will, you know, that people will give them thousands of dollars and, and thinking that the more money they give, the more their life will be blessed. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, we do have this natural law called wawoke, where whatever you how how you communicate returns to you four times as strong. But this does not mean that if you give a uh, hundred dollars, that four hundred is coming back. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that just because you do something good, something better will happen to you. That does not necessarily mean that. When I say the energy comes back to you four times as strong, it's this going to be a blessing that you may not understand right away. It's not material wealth. Yeah, but see, dualistic people don't see it like that. They when 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 they hear that, they think, oh, if I give hundred dollars to the organization, that means four hundred is coming back to me. See, that's how they see it. That's linear thinking. And see, these fake medicine people, they want the people to stay dualistic. So they'll say, yeah, if you give give me $1,000, more will come back to you somehow. So they willingly do it. So they're tricking people. And these people, you know, sometimes they may, they may know, but they don't want to lose their grasp on something they think is holy, when really it's not. You see, what the, what duality leads to? It doesn't lead to a very happy life. A healthy life, I should say. So, And people will do anything that are so scared of being alone that they'll do anything to avoid it. Yeah, and and um, let me say right away that yes, we're not designed to be alone. That's true, but like attracts like. So if you want to be with somebody, and you want the whole experience to be a healthy one, then you have to prepare yourself, and that's this living in a healthy way that I described. Then you'll attract that too. If, whether it's a friend or a relationship, yeah. So then your your friendship 
or your relationship will will be healthy too. And both of you will grow from it. You're not completing each other. No, your 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 friendship or your relationship is actually an extension of both of you. It's your creation from both of you. But you still maintain your 100% and your friend or or um, partner receive, uh, still maintains their 100% too. So you're not completing each other. You're already complete. Rather, you're complementing each other. You're going well with each other because you're both healthy. And your your relationship is something that you're creating together. That's the way it is. But in duality, people say, Oh, I need somebody to complete me. I need to find my other half. That's really unhealthy thinking because it builds an unrealistic, unhealthy dependency on others. And that means irresponsibility in themselves. And that's not going to work. It might appear like it in the beginning, but eventually, you know, things are going to start messing up. That's how that way is. That's the way of duality. And fake medicine men, sometimes they know this, and they, they so they take advantage of it. They say, say, well, we could make a lot of money on that. See, if I was a fake medicine man. I would be charging people $5 a night to listen to this show. <laughs> and I'm not. Yeah, this is this show is free. And in fact, I'm paying for this show. <laughs> yeah, I'm the one who's paying for it to to spread the energy to you. This is the way of the ancestors. Yeah, that's why this show exists. It exists for you. To think about what I said. I don't, you know, I'm not asking for you to believe what I say. I'm just asking for you to think about it. You may disagree with me, and that's fine. As long as we don't force our ideas down each other's throats, that's totally fine. We can agree to disagree on some things and let it be. Yeah, because we're all on journeys. We're all learning. We're always learning. When we're living a healthy life, we're always learning. That's a sign that we're living. So yes, in the Indian world, duality is strong. People um, are capt are capitalizing on it. Uh, Lakota people are exploiting their own. Uh, spirit ceremonies, their own spirituality. There's a, a guy from Pine Ridge, a fake medicine man by the name of David Swallow. Uh, back in the 19... When was it? 1990s. Uh, in his Sundances, uh, he 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 traveled in an RV. His followers bought him an RV, air-conditioned RV, the satellite dish on top. So... During the Sundance, uh, first of all, you had to pay at least $500 to participate in his Sundance. And uh, he would park his RV outside the Sundance arena. So during breaks, he would go to his RV and cool down and have some cold beers. And meanwhile, the singers and dancers are still in the circle. And then when the when the session the next session is going to begin, then he comes out, and then goes back to the circle, and and then continues on with the ceremony. When the day is over, he goes back at his RV, cools off, has some more beer, you know, eats he grilled steaks, you know, for the evening for himself, and then <laughs> that and, and that's I was like that is so so wrong. When you're a real medicine man, you never leave the dancers alone. Never. You're always with them. You sit with them because they're going through a hard time. So you sit with them and you, you walk up and down sometimes and you talk to them. 
you encourage them, hang in there, hang in there. You're doing this for the people. You're, you know, the people need you. The, you know, you, you're doing, the, your ancestors are smiling at you. You know, they go up and down, constantly psyching up the dancers. And then the next round starts and they go out there with the dancers. And when the day is over, they go into the sweat lodge with the dancers. And then when the when the sweat lodge ceremony is over, then they go with the the dancers are supposed to keep separate from their families. Yeah. Four days before the ceremony the dancers separate from their families. And then they and then the, the medicine man stays with them. And then they have the four days of ceremony and after the four days are over they still have to stay separate from their families. Because they have to slowly come back to the reality. And so the medicine man guides them through that the whole time. He never leaves the dancers until that twelfth day. Yeah? When that when that when that last day is is there and the dancers can now reunite with their families and then come back to the real world now. Yeah? That's a real medicine man. But this guy was going into his R V, his air conditioned R V and watching satellite T V at night and drinking beer and smoking marijuana and charging five hundred dollars, at least five hundred dollars per person to participate in his Sundance. And they were paying it. Most of the people there were either white or black or Asian. Not many Indians were actually in that ceremony. You see? Fake medicine men exist among Lakota people too. It's crazy. Really, really crazy. You should never have to give money at a ceremony. If you're participating in one, bring something to some food or tobacco or bring something. But if somebody says, we're asking for monetary donations so we can pay for the food and water, turn yourself around and get the hell out of there. Because you don't know for sure if that money is really being used for that. Yeah, that's not the one to be at. Money should never be a part of the ceremony. Never. So again, if somebody says, you know, to participate, if you want to be with us, that's fine. But we're asking that you give at least thirty-five dollars to help pay for the, the food and the uh, the the you know, that's not the ceremony to be at. Turn around. Even if it, even if they really are doing that, turn around, because that's not the way to do the ceremony. To ask for money, it never was. Yeah, that's protocol. You need to know. It's good, you know, when when people want to learn about Lakota things. It's good, you know. Um, I, I I like that because. It's always good when you to to learn uh about a culture that's different from your own because you can get another insight yeah another perspective but the danger is you have to be careful that you don't look at that culture and then judge it by your culture's perspe- uh, perspectives by your culture's rules because if you do that, then you're ethnocentric, and that is the 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 process behind that is duality. So, for example, let's say I want to learn about Navajos, and so I can, you know, I look for things. As soon as I see something I don't like, then I'm going to say, "Huh? See, that's their pro- that's the problem with them is they do this." You see, if I if I if I communicate like that, I'm being ethnocentric. I'm saying that my culture is better than theirs, and that's I'm putting myself above them. That is duality. The, ch- the the truth is neither one of us is higher than the other. We're just two different cultures. You really shouldn't say one is more highly evolved than the other, because that would be dualistic. Yeah, that would be dualistic to say something like that. People exist. And to do that, they have to do what it takes to live. 
did, and and it, what another, another factor that plays a role is the land that they live in. Maybe it's more conducive to being a farmer. Maybe it's not, so they have to go hunting and gathering. Yeah, and so the ideology uh, is going to develop from that, which means it's coming from the earth. But that doesn't mean that just because people who live in the desert and there's people who live in the mountains and there's people who live in the, the prairies, that doesn't mean anybody is better than the other. It just means it's different. So it's not our right to judge others by our standards. Because that is disrespectful, it's dualistic, it's, ethnocent, it's ethnocentric, and it can lead to racism. Yeah? Like I can... I went to a university in Utah in which there was a lot of Polynesians. There were people from Samoa, both American and Western Samoa. There were people from New Guinea, not New Guinea, uh, New Zealand. Some Maori people from New Zealand that were there. From Hawaiian people were there. There were some uh, Tahitians from Tahiti that were there. Yeah, people um, who were the other ones, uh, Tonga. There were some Tongans that were there too. And uh, boy, the women are pretty. Yeah. Ooh, wow. And uh, and and I became friends with one. Her name was Sylvia. She was from Western Samoa. She's really a nice lady, yeah, really nice lady, pretty, but not just pretty physically, but a very beautiful soul, very you know the when, when you were around her, you just you it made you behave yourself, yeah <laughs> that's the kind of woman she is, yeah you you were at your best you were you were honest with her whenever you 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 were talked with her. You were honest. You wanted to, you just wanted to be around her because she gave out that kind of energy, and you and and, and you you were just in, you encouraged to live healthy around this this lady. Yeah. So can I say that all Samoan women are this way? <laughs> no, I can't. There's healthy and unhealthy wherever you go. Yeah. Can I, uh, there was a, a lady. Um, she says she was half Hawaiian and half Apache. I think her father was in the military and was in a station in Hawaii or something like that. I don't know how that turned out, but. She went out for Miss Indian BYU, yeah, the uh, uh, queen title, at Brigham Young University. That's in Provo, Utah. It's a private Mormon university. And there's a lot of Polynesians there, too, yeah. And there's just a lot of Polynesians in Utah in general, California and Utah, Arizona. Um, not all of them are Mormons, but a lot of them are. Um, I'm not going to go into that. I'm staying with the Polynesian culture here. And this lady, boy, was she stuck up, yeah? <laughs> this whole this Hawaiian Apache lady. She's really pretty. Let me tell you something. That lady was man, she was gorgeous. These Polynesian women are probably some of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And um this this lady was very beautiful. She's half, like I said, she's half Apache and half Hawaiian. And I think she won it that year. I'm not too sure. Wasn't there, uh, but I think she, she won it. I'm really not too sure. It looked really weird um, because the, the Polynesian physical characteristics were stronger than the Apache characteristics. So she, if you saw her, you wouldn't think she was half Apache. She looked more Hawaiian yeah, than Apache. But she was. She was half Apache. And um, 
And it looked really weird to see she, she was doing a women's fancy shawl dance. And it looked weird seeing a Hawaiian girl in the women's fancy shawl regalia. It, it just didn't fit. Yeah, it, it just didn't look right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying I'm not used to seeing that. It's the first time I saw something like that. And it really, um, this was like back in the 1980s. And, and uh, this it just didn't look right yeah? <laughs> to me. I wasn't uh, familiar with it. I wasn't uh, acquainted with it. And, and the other girls, that I knew some of the other girls that were um, going on for that title. They were kind of pissed off because... Uh, uh, they felt that um, she she didn't support any Indian causes on the campus. This this lady, she didn't support this uh, this Hawaiian Apache lady. She didn't su- su- didn't attend any of the American Indian uh, social events that were going on throughout the year. Whenever they were doing something for the Indian club, she was never there. And all of a sudden, here she's up going out for this Miss Indian BYU, and they really didn't like it because they felt that she wasn't a part of the American Indian community, and she didn't do anything to even show interest in the American Indian student population. She only hung out with um, Hawaiian people. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that's how she was. And here, out of the blue, she's going to apply to... To, you know, for, to to this this contest of Miss Indian BYU, and she doesn't even look like an Indian, even though she is. And um, and she won it, and that pissed off the other girls because they they felt that you know this lady didn't do anything for the Indian community, and here she is representing the Indian community. So uh, they were saying uh, they told her you better change that. Yeah, uh, you're now now here you are, you're Miss Indian BYU, and you better change your outlook here, you know, because if you're if you're just doing this just you know to to put it on your resume, you know, that's that's really not the Indian way to take advantage of another culture like that. And that's kind of racist. So, um, I don't know what happened because by that time I I left. Yeah, I was out of that area. And um, but I remember that, and I remember that this girl was not friendly at all. And uh, um, so, can I say uh, because of that, is it okay for me to say that all Hawaiian girls are like that? That even those are pretty, they're all bitches. Huh? Brenda, is is it okay for me to say that? Hey. <laughs> She's the Hawaiian girl. Yeah? <laughs> I'm just teasing. No, it's not okay. Yeah, because like I said, it's healthy and unhealthy everywhere you go. So I just gave you some examples here. Of some fake, uh, there's some real Lakota men who are fake Indian healers. Uh, they do it for money. They do it to trick people. They con people out of thousands of dollars. These are full blood Lakota Indians. Yeah. This David Swallow, I saw him on a YouTube interview, and he was doing a one of his fake ceremonies somewhere in in Texas, and um, <laughs> he they interviewed him, and they he 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 goes around saying he's. He's the medicine men of all medicine men is basically what he's trying to get get people to believe. And they asked him, there was a white buffalo calf that was born down there in somebody's ranch, and they went and they, he went down there with his followers to you know pray and stuff like that. So they asked him what he thought. And he said, "Well, he said, what I really want to do is that." If I had the opportunity, I would kill that white buffalo, he said. And I was like, what? (laughs) Jeez, 
that I think if I think if if he said that in the presence of real Lakota spiritual people, they would have taken him aside and uh, told him, you know, you don't represent the people, and and, and the, the things you're saying are are very disrespectful to the ancestors. Be careful because, uh, you know, this Wawokia thing, yeah, that what you do and how you do it, that's going to come back to you. Yeah? And, I mean, we have a, this got this activist that's dead now, this Russell Means. He's another guy who is really a rugged guy, too. I mean, this guy, beat when he was younger, he beat up his father-in-law. He's a Navajo elder. He beat him up, sent him to the hospital. In a Lakota way, you're taught to respect your elders, even if they're wrong, and you know you're right. You do not beat them up. Yeah, and then Russell was trying to, uh, he was trying to fight against the Navajo tribal court system by saying they can't keep him in their jail because he's not a Navajo. If he had won that court case, that would have opened the door for Washington, D.C. to wipe out sovereignty for all Indian tribes in America. So just because he wanted to stay out of the Navajo jail, he would have he would have uh, forced all tribes to lose sovereignty just because of his selfishness. That's not a man. That's a coward. That's not the way of a warrior. Yeah, and another thing he said is that people from different races and cultures should not marry each other and have children because when they do, they they um, weaken the species of both races. So he's saying if you're if you're an Indian, then you shouldn't be marrying a white person or a black person or an Asian person because then you're you're what you're creating is an abomination. That's what he's saying. That's Hitler talk. That's Ku Klux Klan talk. That's not the way of the ancestors. That's duality. See, there's another example of a, a Lakota man who is not a good man. These guys are not allowed to be leaders in the ancient world. When When these kind of guys existed in the ancient world, the society put them down immediately because they could destroy the whole camp. And the camp is more important than the individual. So a person like Russell Means would have never existed in those ancient times. He's not he's not on the same level as Sitting Bull. He's not even worth a butt hair of Sitting Bull. And yet people all elevate him because they're all dualistic. But he's a racist. See, that's another example that not all Indians are good. This was a guy that he said a lot of hateful things yeah, against uh, people who are different skin color. He used his mouth to spread poison throughout the world and tried to say it was the Lakota way. How do you think he died? He died of cancer in his throat and his tongue. You see what I mean? You have to be careful with this, the way you communicate because that's going to come back to you and it's going to take you. So what really happened? When you're traditional, you understand that concept of what will care. And if, if, you, if, you, if you go ahead and do it anyway, you're going to pay for it. There's going to be a price. You're going to pay that price. And of course, you know, I, I, I don't know if, if, if that guy was my dad I think I would change my name right away. Seriously. If I knew, you know, because 
I, if my dad said to me, don't be in Germany, don't be going out with white women, don't be going out with German women, I would disown my dad because I know what he's saying is wrong. But I know what he's saying is racist. My dad never said that to me, by the way. He was he was happy that I was here. So I could teach people over here too. In Europe. So my dad was happy that I was here. Yeah? So thank God my dad had more wisdom than Rasul means. He was a better man. He was a man. He was my dad was a warrior. Mr. Means is a coward. That's not a warrior. And that's going to piss a lot of people off. But I represent the ancestors. I do not represent, you know, duality. So I will say, I will be very bold in the things that I say on this show. And people, if you disagree, deal with it. Yeah, that's... uh, how you react to things is a communication and that says a lot about what's going on inside of you. But if you can agree to disagree, we can still have peace. But that's your decision. To me, it doesn't bother me. But I do have to point out, when somebody says something so hateful as to say that a little baby who's just born, who took his first breath of air and is crying because he's here now in the new world, just come out of his mother, the soul just entered the top of his head, but this baby's boy, this baby's father is black and the mother is Lakota, and you can you really say to that baby, you are an abomination? Because that's what Russell Means is saying. That is racist. I have to deal with that kind of energy coming from my own people all the time. I have people, uh, my own people accusing me of selling ceremonies over here. I, I have never done one ceremony here in Europe. They don't belong here. They don't belong in Arizona either. They don't belong in Seattle. They don't belong in Washington. They don't belong in Oregon. They only belong in Lakota homeland. They don't belong in California. They don't belong in China or Tokyo or France or, you know, England. They only belong in the homeland, Lakota homeland. That's the way it is. Yeah. That's when that's when we say ho hechetu welo. Yeah. That's that's the way it is. That's the ancestral teaching. And lots of people may not agree with it. And that shows a reflection of where they are in their healthiness. Yeah. And I know there's people that are saying, yeah, just let David speak. He's going to get his. Don't worry. (laughs) I hope so. Because I am telling the truth. So I really do hope I get my reward. (laughs) I'm not concerned about that either. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I always wonder what the Means family says about the actions of Russell Means beating the crap out of his father-in-law and saying racist things like children who have co- come from two different cultures are are abominations. Yeah? I wonder what his family believes about that. Do they believe the same thing too? Cuz that would make the whole family racist if they are like that. And um, how do they justify? I know some people say, well, look at the good things that he's done. Then we got to focus on that. No, no, that's wrong. That is unhealthy. Whenever you look at something and you just choose to look at one aspect, what is that? That's duality. When you just say, okay, let's just focus on this part. That's the good part. Ignore the rest. Just focus on this part. Because that's the good part. That's dualistic. That's not the Lakota way. 
In the Lakota world, for one thing, you don't put another human above another. So you don't say he's a leader of the people. That's not what you say in Lakota. Yeah? In, in Lakota, you say he's serving the people. They are servants. They're under the people. They don't tell the people what they do. They go and help the people. They help the people to understand. They want the people to know. So you have to look at the whole situation. And you don't label any part as good or bad. But you label it as, was this healthy or unhealthy? And in Lakota tradition, when you, as a young person, beat up an old man or an old woman, this is something you can't come back from. Your name is spread around that you do not respect anyone, including yourself. Because if you beat up a old man just because you disagree with him, maybe you're going to beat up a little kid too. Maybe you're going to beat up women. This is not our way. So that, to me, is a big thorn that you should not ignore. And then to be so selfish as to stay out of, you know, just to stay out of jail for beating up an old man. And then to, to say, "Why well, you can't keep me in that jail because that's a different tribe. Then why is he living there? By saying, I'm Lakota and, and, and you can't keep me in a Navajo jail because I'm Lakota. See, he's 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 he he he's he's saying he's saying that you know they can't hold him because they're not the same tribe. That act, if he had won that court case, now thank thank goodness he lost, but if he had won it, all tribes in America would have lost sovereignty on that one court case. So he would have. He says he's fighting for the freedoms of Indian people, but he would have caused all Indian nations to lose sovereignty just because he didn't want to go to jail for beating up his father-in-law. Now, that is not the way of a warrior. That is a coward. I've said that before. Even before he died, I said this, and I wanted to say it to his face, but this guy avoids you. If you're not a famous Hollywood star, he's not going to talk to you. This guy avoided me in Eagle Butte on the Shan River Sioux Reservation. I tried to confront this guy, but he's like, oh, you're a nobody. Get away from me, you, you, uh, you know, peasant. That's his mentality. He has to be the star, the only one there. Everybody else is underneath him. This is not a humble man. And I know that's going to piss off all his relatives and his supporters, but Hey, I do not support duality, I do not support racism, and I do not support cowardice. This show is about living in a healthy lifestyle, which is a warrior way, a way of, of sharing, a way of supporting and helping one another, regardless of skin color. That's the way of the ancestors. This is the way to live. So that's that's the purpose of this show. So anyway, um, just think about it, yeah. And again, you know, I'm not asking for you to agree, but what I'm saying tonight is based on Lakota Star knowledge. And Lakota Star knowledge says it is racist when you say that a child who has parents from two different skin colors that that child is an abomination. That is racist. That is unhealthy. The Lakota Star Knowledge teaches that when humans come on the earth, they come in five areas. They show up in five different areas. At that time, there's only one continent. What used to be east and west today is north and south. These people, when they met each other, they noticed that their babies speak the same language. From the babies, we learned we are all the same that we are all humans. And the wisdom came from the children. They communicated with each other regardless of their differences. 
They motion to each other. Let's climb this tree. Let's go throw some sticks in the water and play boats. Let's go roll down the hill. And they play together. That's wisdom. That's why they call themselves Ikche Oyate, human nations. Not red nation, but human nation. There's no word in Lakota stories that says that we were red. It never says that. That's a modern thing that was created in the early 1900s when we became Christians and learned about Christopher Columbus. The red road is not the Indian way. It's the way to live. 